All right, everyone, let's get the show started. Welcome to Office Hours. It's February 12th, 2020. My name is Eric Osterman, and I'll be leading the conversation. I'm the CEO and founder of Cloud Posse. We are a DevOps accelerator. We help startups own their infrastructure in record time by building it for you and then showing you the ropes. For those of you new to the call, the format is very informal. My goal is to get your questions answered. So feel free to unmute yourself at any time if you want to jump in and participate. If you're tuning in from our podcast or YouTube channel, you can register for these live and interactive sessions just by going to cloudposse.com slash office hours. Again, cloudposse.com slash office hours. We host these calls every week. We'll automatically post a recording of this session to the Office Hours channel, as well as follow up with an email so you can share it with your team. If you want to share something in private, just ask and we can temporarily suspend the recording. With that said, let's kick things off. So here are some talking points that we can cover to get the conversation going. Uh, obviously, first, I want to first uh, cover any of your questions. Uh, so some of the things that uh, came across or came up in the past week since we had our last call is, um, uh, Terraform Cloud now supports uh, triggers across workspaces. Uh, John just shared that this morning. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit. The new AWS CLI is available uh, with no more Python dependencies. However, uh, I'm still not celebrating it entirely based on my initial uh, review. Uh, also, there's a really wise quote that was uh, succinctly put in our uh, community uh, yesterday or something, it was like, you know, if you can't commit to the overhead required to run something, you're introducing a weakness into the system rather than a strength, as they'll quickly end up uh, in the critical path. So that was uh, the way that uh, Chris Faust said something, and I want to talk about that some more, see what reactions we get. But uh, before we go into those things, let's see what, uh, what questions uh, you guys have. I have one thing. Uh, when you're going through Terraform, uh, Terraform Cloud, can you also go through just your general experiences with it? I know Brian and I were uh, looking at using it earlier this week, and we were just having a little bit of uh, some pain doing so. Yeah, just some general experience with that would be useful. I I, I can uh, I can give some kind of like armchair. Uh review of Terraform Cloud. We are not using it in production uh, as part of any customer engagements. We've done our own prototypes and POCs. So uh, I think the best thing would be if when we get to that point, if there are other people on the call that are actually doing it day to day. I know uh, John Bland has been doing a lot with Terraform Cloud. Uh, I don't know, let, let me uh, ping him on SweetOps. Let's see if uh, he can join and share some of his experiences. Do, do you guys know if you can continue using remote state with like S3 with Terraform Cloud? I couldn't figure out how to do that. Oh, you, you should be able to. Let me explain. So, mm, it's a good question, but uh, yeah, I'm not 100% on that. Uh, so I thought you could an intuitive. So, yeah, so I, I, yeah, I cannot speak uh, from experience trying to do it. Um, what were your problems when you tried? I mean, I assume you, you had the AWS credentials and everything hard coded. Uh, and if you have that provider block or that, that back end uh, set up, set up it, it, was it erroring or it requires that or it validates that you have a Terraform workspace back end? I, I personally can't even find the place where you can even put in Terraform Cloud the AWS creds. Oh, it would be an environment setting. So you, there's the ability uh, you, to it As an environment variable? Oh, I don't like yeah, that. Yeah, 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 exactly. You have to do that for every single workspace? Yep. Uh, as retarded as it is, exactly. We don't like that either. No. Oh, awesome. John's uh, joining us right now. So John has spent a lot of time with Terraform Cloud, so uh, he can probably answer some of these questions. Let's see. Uh, what he... Here. Hey, Mark. Welcome. Howdy. How's it going? Have you, uh, Mark? Have you gotten to play with Terraform Cloud at all yet? No, I haven't even uh, browsed the docs. Okay. Just curious. But Brian, you are uh, you're you're you've been dabbling with Terraform Cloud a little bit, or? Yeah, I just checking it out. I, it, it was because I was working on the Terraform provision uh, provisioning of my EFS. 
I was like, mm. I can't kill two birds with one stone. Yeah. Um, and uh, dabbled with it, didn't love it. Um, so I probably am just going to do my Terraform provisioning and code fresh. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit more intuitive for me, especially because I use Terraform CLI workspaces. Yeah. Uh, um, it, it'll be a lot easier for me to implement something that's that's dry and reusable if I were to just do like a code a code fresh that 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 already does the right like uh, workspaces uh, commands for me. Yeah, so I'm hoping that maybe in a couple of weeks or a few weeks, maybe we can do a revised code fresh Terraform demo on this. We did one about a year ago or more. Um, but uh, this time Jeremy on my team is working on it and we want to kind of recreate some of the constructs of Terraform Cloud but inside of CodeFresh so that it integrates more with like all the other pipelines and workflows we have there. On the topic of Terraform, I would want to, I would want to ask, so like I go back and forth on uh, my decision to use Terraform workspaces. Uh, mm -hmm. I love the fact that it was so easy to, um, you know, use the same configuration code for so many different environments, and I've been able to take advantage of that. Um, what I didn't love was um, having to kind of act together a way to get all the backends to point to different S3 buckets and different AWS accounts. Um, I'm curious if anybody's ever worked with that plus if they ever switched off of it to go the other route where you kind of have um, configuration per, per AWS account that might be less dry, slash using Telegram. Okay, let's, uh, <laughs> let's yeah, okay, let's, let's table that temporarily. I see John just joined us here. Let's, uh, let's start with the first question there on uh, first-hand accounts and experiences using Terraform Cloud. I know John has spent a lot of time with it, so I'd love uh, to, for you guys to hear it from him. He's also a great talk speaker. Well, thank you. I send the check in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually, uh, I've done a lot with Terraform Cloud um, as the primary CI for all of our Terraform. And generally, I like it, um, mainly because it's a little malleable. Like you can use it for, like the whole CI aspect, or you can run your CI, I mean, your Terraform in CodeFresh or anywhere, and it's just your back end. That's it. <clears throat> Instead of having S3 buckets everywhere, all your state is just stored there. Really easy to do remote data, things of that sort. Um, terraforming it is really easy too, because they have a provider that gives you full access. Um, and I did see on the um, agenda there, the talking points, the uh, workspace, the run triggers. I actually did a video earlier, I'll be posting that on YouTube. Already? Um, wow. Yeah, 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 share that to the Office Apps <clears throat> channel. Yeah, I wanted to um, just play with it, and I was like, oh, might as well record it. Um, and it's decent. I think they have some improvements to do um, to be able to visualize it, but um, we actually do utilize, um, I forget who was speaking, Brian, I think, uh, we do utilize uh, multiple AWS environments. And from our Terraform scripts where we set it up, uh, we actually have each workspace uh, control, or we tell each workspace which environment it's going to use. Um, now, this is using access key and secret key. Um, preferably, we have something a little more um, cleaner that was a lot more secure than just having stale access keys sitting around. So that's one gripe I did have with it. But <clears throat> in general, um, we've had a lot of success um, running it in Terraform Cloud. What are, um, okay, and you, you, so you're leveraging like the Terraform Cloud. I don't want to say it's like a, a feature of Terraform Cloud, but the, like the best practices of Terraform Cloud uh, using workspaces. So you're using lots of workspaces in Terraform Cloud. And um, uh, how, how has that been? Because while workspaces has existed for some time, it wasn't previously recommended as a pattern for separating, uh, you know, multiple stages like production versus dev. Um, how's that working out? It actually worked out really well because <clears throat> locally, whenever you set it up, you can set up locally and, um, yeah, let me share a screen. I can yeah, show let me stop quick. sharing here one second. There you go. There is a difference between Terraform Cloud Workspaces and, and the Terraform CLI Workspace though. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah, so the, this is just my little sample account that I play around with for the tutorials. But if this was set up um, locally in the CLI, and because this prefix is the same, I can set my prefix locally and my local workspaces will be called integer, pet, and separated. And so locally, I, it maps directly to the local CLI actually. So I can say Terraform uh, workspace select integer and now I'm on that and I can TF plan and it'll run my plan right here on Terraform uh, Cloud. I don't have to have variables or nothing locally. It'll run everything there um, unless it's set up as a local because um, you have multiple settings here. Would you be able to do a live <laughs> demo of that right now? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> this is exactly what I'm, we're trying to do. And, and if you're saying that it's actually much easier than um, I initially thought, then I might reinvestigate this. Let's try it. <laughs> <laughs> but thanks for uh, rolling the dice. Yeah. All right, so for everyone else, uh, maybe if you just joined, uh, John has uh, been put on the spot here to do a unplanned for demo of Terraform Cloud and uh, workspaces, um, possibly even the new beta triggers function, but. Um, yeah, I can definitely show it. It's, it's set up there and working. I can definitely walk through it, so. The, the triggers uh, from uh, beta would be especially useful for us as well. Because there are scenarios where we run multiple Terraform applies more uh, synchronously. Yeah. Hold on. Let me pause the share so I don't show some. We can also. Stuff you, I'm not supposed to. Uh, John, do you want to have like five minutes, uh, and then we can uh, uh, talk about some other things and come right back to this? Yeah, let me get um, a few of my things here uh, okay. lined up, just the connection and all that sort of stuff. And yeah, 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 cool. Let's let's do that, and uh, we'll just keep the conversation going on other things. Um, see what we can talk about there. All right. Uh, any other questions? All right. So. I guess we'll, uh, I'm going to skip the Terraform cloud uh, talking point about uh, triggers across workspaces. I think that's going to be really awesome to get a demo. Basically, to, to set that up, um, you, you know, as you decompose your Terraliths into multiple <coughs> projects, how do you still kind of get that same experience where once you uh, apply changes in one environment, it can uh, trigger changes in another environment? Um, and that's uh, what, the, what these triggers are now for. Uh, moving on, um, AWS announced uh, this week that there's a new CLI available. I'm not sure how new it is per se, uh, but they are providing um, a uh, binary release of this CLI. I, I, I suppose it's still probably in Python. They're just uh, compiling it to uh, bytecode. Um, my, the downside from when I was looking at it is it's not just a single binary you can go download somewhere. There's still like an AWS CLI installer. Uh, so they're following like the Java pattern, right? Where you still got to download zips and install stuff. Personally, I just, I've gotten so spoiled by Go uh, projects, which distribute a single self-contained binary. And I just download that from a GitHub release page and I'm, I'm set to go. So uh, has anybody given this uh, new CLI a shot? Not you, Mark? Calling you out. All right. Um, nope, not yet. Yep. Cool. And then uh, there was one other thing that came up um, this week as somebody was asking kind of like, you know, uh, I, I think the question, the background question was like alternatives to running Vault and uh, if, if it's worth uh, to run Vault. And uh, Chris, uh, Chris Fowles uh, responded quite succinctly. It's not that, you know, we've heard this said before, but I thought this is a really succinct way of putting it. And that's like, when, when you, if you can't commit to the overhead required to run some new technology like Kubernetes vault or console, you're introducing a weakness into the system rather than a strength as they'll quickly end up uh, in the critical path uh, of your operations. And 
Uh, I think this really resonated with me, especially since we run this DevOps accelerator. And our whole premise is that we want our customers to uh, run and, uh, and take ownership of their infrastructure. But if they don't understand what they, they have and what they're running, then this is a massive liability at the same time, which is why we only work with customers ultimately that have some in-house expertise to take over uh, this stuff and operate it. Also, uh, Alex just, uh, yeah, <laughs> getting some thumbs up here uh, from Alex Siegman and Brian Ty both uh, agreeing with this statement. Actually, yeah, that actual response was a, it's supposed to response to something that I mentioned. So the original person asking the question was asking about um, KMS and, and also Gitcrypt from what I understand. And I just thought that maybe I'd remind them, you know, like maybe you want to just give centralized service management um, a shot. So Vault really is, um, like, I don't want to sound like I'm pushing it that much, but the, the reality is if you look at a HashiCorp, um, that created Terraform and created Vault. They make most of their money from Vault. They yeah. really do put a lot of product hours into featuring, uh, sorry, uh, widening the feature set yeah. of that product. Um, so it really is a mature solution, yeah. about 100%. When it comes to um, uh, Fowles' uh, response, it's very true. What, what happens actually a lot of the time is if you don't commit, a lot of people, they like they take the root token and then they distribute it to everybody and it becomes more of a, a security hold than a security feature, really. Yeah. Um, and it, it really, it's uh, reminiscent of Kubernetes as well, um, in my opinion. You really need like a, a large team of people putting energy into that um, to actually make full use of it. So it's not a burden anymore. It's actually something that can help you pick up velocity. Exactly. Like you, you want to take these things when... Uh when it gives you a, an advantage, a competitive advantage for your business or the problems you're trying to solve, not just because, uh, you know, it's a cool uh, toy or it sounds interesting. But yeah, that was a really uh, good uh, summary of it. Thank you. For, for pure just secrets management, I would probably, uh, it's, it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of, of Vault, obviously, but um, I went with, AWS Secrets Manager, or you can use Parameter Store. Those are much easier to maintain. Yeah. Are you making copious use of the Lambdas as well with Secrets Manager to do the automatic rotations? Uh, not yet, but I, but definitely something that I wish I had time for. Yeah. Because it also requires uh, application changes, right? To take yeah. All right, John, are you, uh, uh, do you need some more time? Nope, ready to go. All right, awesome, let's get the show started. All right, so this is gonna be a Terraform Cloud uh, demo and possibly a demo of uh, uh, triggers across workspaces, which is a beta feature in Terraform Cloud. All right, um, so this isn't going to actually give me a plan because I don't have the actual code for these repos locally uh, on this computer. So. <clears throat> but this is the tie-in to show how the workspaces actually work. So essentially, you set up your backend as remote. Um, host name, you don't really have to have it. That's the default. What organization? And in this case, I'm saying prefix. So if I actually change this and let's say name to random, and if I did an init on this, <clears throat> Well, I guess I need a yes there. Oh, because I already initialized, that's why. So by setting the name, essentially, it's, well, it's supposed to, what did I miss? It worked just a minute ago, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> it's always this way. All right, let me uh, clean up this Terraform directory. Um, but by saying a name, I, I kind of found this by accident. Um, I didn't mean for it to do it, but, but there you go. Um, it'll actually create the workspace for you. So you technically don't have to, you know, do anything to create a workspace. It'll do it for you. Uh, in that case, it doesn't give all the configuration there. But if you use, utilize prefix here instead of name, and let me just wipe and init, 
what it does is basically query to Terraform Cloud and it says, hey, everything with this as a prefix does going to be my workspaces. So in this mm -hmm. case, I can say, let me select the integer workspace. Oh, that's awesome. And so if I do a workspace list here, you'll see that same list there. And then you can do select, pet, separator, any one of those. Um, you can also, uh, I have an alias for Terraform, by the way. So that's why I'm just saying TF. Um, you can also, you know, get your state. Um, <clears throat> of course, if you have uh, access to that. And so we can say show. And we can pull that locally. And so it'll output the actual state here. Um, and then my favorite part is actually planning. So I don't have any variables or anything. Mind you, this workspace doesn't have a lot anyway, um, but um, it's actually running this plan on Terraform Cloud. It's piping the same output. It's common, just like you would normally expect. Uh, so it's piping everything to my local CLI here, but or uh, console, um, but it's basically this. So you can see the output matches. Um, but the, the beauty of this part is I can have all of my variables in here um, completely hidden, any secrets that I want, um, and none of my developers ever see them. Uh, they never know that they exist or anything locally, but they can plan all day and do whatever they want. And so this is destroying because I don't have the code. So it's like, well, it's gone, this random resource integer. Um, but that's the quick run through of utilizing those workspaces uh, locally. Um, and it's really just this. And I have a TFR set with my token locally. So that's how I have that working. Also go back to uh, the Terraform Cloud uh, UI there where you had the settings, the variables. Mm -hmm. just, because, just because it came up a second, uh, a little while ago, uh, Brian was asking about environment variables. You see there at the bottom, Brian? That's yeah. If you need uh, AWS credentials, uh, you can stick to that. Where are you? Oh, okay, you're not using AWS provider right now. Um, no, I'm not. In this demo, but yeah. No. Okay. And, um, but, and nothing precludes you from using the AWS provider, right? So long as you still provide the uh, credentials here. Yep. So, so um, you know your random workspace that got created? Do you have to go, do you manually go in and add the AWS creds for those? Um, I actually terraform the entire thing. Awesome. Um, so that's all done through Terraform. So basically Terraforming Terraform Cloud. Um, so essentially I'll generate a workspace and that'll have my you know, general settings there. And then I just utilize TFE variables. And you can do environment variables this way too. So you can kind of tie this in too with uh, like uh, your token refreshes and things of that sort. Um, like especially those of mention of Vault. So there's the Vault provider, and you could actually tap into Vault through here, actually get you a token key from your AWS or however you want to do your authentication there, get your token um, from AWS, your access key, et cetera, and then plug that into um, Terraform Cloud. So that way it's all automated and you're not just pasting mm -hmm. variables in there. Do you, do you have to run your own vault or do they run that for you? No, you, if you're running your own. So uh, what, assume, assume someone doesn't have vault. Yeah. How, do you, how do you plumb AWS credentials in or STS token generation in? Uh, so we use KMS. So just utilize KMS to mark them all as, like you don't want to put that stuff in code, right? And so use KMS, encrypt the values manually. Um, we built a little internal tool to do it, but um, encrypt those values, put them in code, and then once the workspace actually runs, um, it'll actually create, manage, update all the other workspaces. So in essence, you have one workspace that has all the references to all the other workspaces it's supposed to create, and it'll configure everything. And so in that one, it'll decrypt the KMS and then add it to the project or the specific workspace as a uh, environment variable. Got it. And so there's... When you, when you say KMS, you're using SSM? Uh, we do use SSM. Yeah. To store the, the product of the KMS encryption blob? No, no, no. So we just encrypt the value in KMS, but we actually, um, we actually use it um, 
SSM4 uh, Fargate sequence. Uh, but this repo here um, is where I, and I actually have a video um, of it, where I kind of walk through um, how to do the full, the full thing with uh, Terraform in your own workspace and then using um, the remote data as well to pull from it. And so the uh, pipeline um, feature um, that I was playing with earlier uh, essentially, this repo, I mean, this workspace is going to trigger this one, it's going to trigger this one. And so the way it's set up, and they definitely say do not use this in production yet, um, but these run triggers uh, here. So you can specify um, all your workspaces that you want to actually trigger something here. And so anytime they trigger, uh, oh, it's a loop, because I already have that one set. Um, anytime they trigger, they'll actually trigger the next one. Um, but I'm going to delete these real quick and I'll just show a quick run. And so if I cube this one, yeah, where it finally kicks off, there we go. So it's going to go through the plan and this is just going to generate a random integer. It has an output um, and all it does is output the results of random integer. And so once it finishes the plan, it's actually going to show me which or any workspaces that it will trigger next. In this case, random separator. So if I go ahead and confirm. And so this one is applying. If I come over to random separator, nothing's happening here. I'm not, I haven't hit anything, haven't pressed any buttons. Uh, this apply is finished. And there's random separator that was triggered automatically. And so you can see like it's essentially going to go down the line there. The good thing is it will tell you here that the run was triggered from this workspace and it was triggered from that run. So you can kind of rabbit hole your way backwards uh, into finding where and what actually triggered that one. And so if I confirm and apply on this one, this one is actually going to trigger the last one, which is random pet. And I'll pull up the code real quick as well. All right, so that one finished and random pet is here. And there's random pet running. Quick, quick question. Do you guys ever use, um because I know with the VCS integrations, you can actually kick off a plan or an apply from like GitHub, for example. You guys ever use that? Yes, exclusively. Awesome. Yeah. And so this is these repos are actually tied up through GitHub as well. Do you do the and confirms through GitHub or do you send them to the UI here? Uh, do it through the uh, UI here. You could tie it in like there's a CLI. You can tie it in and uh, do it through any CI really. Um, and so there's the end of the pipeline. But as you can kind of tell, like you will rabbit hole, right? Like you're gonna, you're here and then it's like, well, this was generated from here. And you go back there and it's like, well, this one was generated from another one. And so then you end up having to go back there. So I, a, a good visual tool would be really useful. Um, like Jenkins Blue Ocean or something where, you know, or Circle CI kind of shows you the path of something would be really useful, but uh, it's kind of interesting. I'm sure that's coming. Yeah. yeah. So, and so uh, th this code, just to show this real quick, um, is using the remote state. And so I set up variables manually uh, for this demo, but uh, utilizing these variables and it just uses the remote state data to get the value from the integer workspace. And then the pet um, basically uses two remote datas to get the workspace state for both the separator and the integer uh, workspace. And then it just uses it down here in the random pet. So it's, it's decent. I'm liking where they're going, you know. Yeah, I think this has some potential, especially to uh, minimize the configuration drift and simplify the uh, effort of ensuring that changes promote 
through multiple workspaces. Right. And the good thing is like, if you saw on separator, I actually had to confirm. Um, and of course, that depends on your settings, of course, because mm -hmm. um, you can tell it if you want to auto apply, you know, or manual apply. In this case, I'm set to manual. That makes sense. But if it was auto, it would have just triggered all the way down the line as many. And so the practicality of it is like if you separate your networking stack from your application and you update your networking stack and for whatever reason it needs to run the application Terraform as well, you can kind of automate that now as opposed to, well, you ran that one and now the one person in the company that knows the order can, can go in and manually hit Q on something else. So, yeah. So I think there was some questions in the chat here. Uh, let's see, uh, Alex uh, Siegman asks, um, how do you handle the chicken and the egg problem with bootstrapping, say, an AWS account and then uh, Terraform uh, Enterprise to have creds uh, and such? Um, That's actually a good question. So it would have to come from some somewhere, right? So like, especially if you set up like AWS organizations um, and you had like your root account that you were set with, you can utilize that root account and you can actually Terraform uh, ter uh, AWS orgs. And then once that new account is set up, you can uh, assume role and those sort of things uh, in order to access that, that other client, I mean, that other account. Um, but there is still some manual aspects of that, right? Like you have to insert your email address and then that email address is your root account. And then you want to kind of lock that down so you can do use like some service control policies and things of that sort, but there's still a little bit of a manual piece to bootstrap a full account. Yeah. Um, that, that's the part that really sucks. And we go through this in every engagement, right? Because if you don't reset the password and have uh, MFA added, anybody with access to email of that root account uh, of that uh, sub account or the root account for that matter can do a password reset and uh, take over the account. Yep, exactly. Um, and so there was a question about automating the destruction. Um, so Terraform cloud actually requires you to uh, set confirm destroy. So one. So if you do automate, confirm, destroy, um, set to one, then yes, you can. Um, you can delete from Terraform Cloud, but you can't queue or destroy unless you actually have that environment variable set. So you can set it like and have it as a part of your workspace, and then you know TF destroy will actually destroy. Nice. That's cool. Um, but yes, that, that aspect of the chicken and egg is something that is um, definitely something that could be cleaned up on the AWS side just to help the bootstrapping, especially for the clients that have like 70 AWS accounts. Yeah. Which isn't as abnormal as it sounds. It's not an enterprise. Yeah. Um, any other questions related to Terraform Cloud? Got it. I'll put this right. link here in, no, in the uh, chat. Cost value uh, uh, opinions? Uh, now it's way better. Um, <laughs> before it was, it was rough, like um, multiple tens of thousands of dollars for the enterprise version. Um, and so now it's actually to where you can basically sign up and utilize it, you know, now for free. You do have to keep in mind that it is still a subset of uh, TFC features, but it, it is really good. And it is obviously if you're a small team and you don't have a hundred thousand dollars to spend then yeah, but you right. can see here that it is a subset. Yep. And so the main things that you do miss cost estimation is actually pretty cool. It will tell you if you're starting up like, a, you know, T3 micro, how much that's going to cost or, you know, in five large, it'll kind of give you those pieces. It's an estimate, but it kind of helps. And you can utilize uh, Sentinel, uh, which is basically poly policy as code. You utilize Sentinel and say, no one can create a project 
um, if the cost is over $1,000 or whatever. Um, or you can say, hey, notify somebody or whatever, um, or it requires approval. And so Sentinel is actually pretty useful. Um, and then of course you get the normal SAML, and this is the private install, the SAML clustering, all that as you go up, but you can- It is a little bit funny how it goes from unlimited work, everything else is unlimited and limited workspaces, then you go to enterprise. Nope, not unlimited anymore. Just a hundred plus. Uh, but I mean, really this free um, up to five users is pretty much all you would really need unless you are on a larger team and you need roles. Yeah. And the roles basically plan, read, write, you know, and admin um, support. But the private registry is actually pretty cool too. Mm -hmm. I think us, us as a, as a uh, profession need to push back on enterprises that try to make you pay for security. Here, the yeah. SAML SSO is, is a, pretty much the only thing controlling the keys to your castle. And I don't think that it's right for people to hold security as a, as a tool for making money. Yeah, and that's like always their one too, right? Like, yeah, but I, I hope I hope we get the industry aligned with security as a first, you know, like the you know, first class citizen of all products, not just for if you're willing to pay. Yeah, yeah, brother. We, we've so, shared this before, like the SSO tax website. Go to yeah. SSO tax. Uh, yeah. yeah, it says it all. <laughs> get another. It's funny. It's uh, the wall of shame uh, and the price thing <laughs> increases. This is hilarious. That's hilarious. They need to add Terraform Cloud in here now. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Base price, SSO pricing. It, it's just insane, the gouging that goes on. Look at HubSpot marketing. <laughs> Jesus, 6,300% increase. Yeah, 586. Call us. <laughs> oh, you want two factor? Oh, that's going to cost you. Yeah. Yeah, two factor is another one. Yeah. Well, I mean, that it comes usually with whatever you picked as your SSO. Right. So, yeah. But I don't know, does Terraform Cloud uh, offer a two factor? It does. Okay. Yeah. So I have one uh, set up here, just normal. Uh, I use Authy and it, it works. But then again, I'm also. I have my day jobs account on there so, and it's paid. So maybe that's, <laughs> yeah, maybe that's where it comes from. Maybe that's not on the free. Any other questions on cloud? For, for, um, for a small team, do you guys think $7 a month is worth it for just Sentinel? Uh, it depends what kind of, um, what kind of roles do you have in place for like your infrastructure? Like, uh, team is a team of one right now, so there is no uh, like actual rules uh, automated, but obviously um, being proactive about it just when I'm spinning up infrastructure. Um, but as the team grows, and I, I think we're growing out our security function here too, I think uh, a lot of security engineers I'm talking to, they're doing it manually where they go into your AWS console and like check if you know how you have s3 buckets that are public um i was saying like we could automate this with sentinel i was curious if i do you know say a team of five is seven dollars a month worth it um if if you have those sort of rules in place yes yeah um, this is basically like a preemptive you can choose to block or you can just warn um and so like in this case it was essentially a function and they're adding to this resources and they end up pulling it back, right? Um, yeah. And so you can basically take those things and as you validate them, you can give specific messages that you want um, and basically say yay or nay if it's approved and it'll basically block the run. So it is a good way to catch it ahead of time um, and you can catch some of those things. Um, another thing that you can, um, what is it? Is it TF security? We, we talked about open policy uh, agent integration with Terraform that uh, can also do some of this stuff. And also someone else recommended ConfTest, which is 
built on top of uh, OPA and adds support for HCL and Terraform plans as well. Yeah, there's a, a little library that's like a linter as well, TFSet. Mm. This one. And it's pretty decent too. And it can catch like S3 buckets and HTTP versus HTTPS. And it also provides um, a way uh, here to where you can take these rules and you can actually ignore it for like a specific line. Mm. Like if you, you want an ingress here and you don't care about this, uh, this rule here, it's just, it's a requirement. You have to have it, then you can ignore it. Uh, but you can tie this directly in with CI and just run tfsec dot nice. or locally with Docker. And so I would probably start there as opposed to going to Sentinel because then you do have to manage, well, you have to write the Sentinel policy. Then you need to manage that. Um, and then you, you assume a lot of that risk at that point too. Yeah, all the, you have to develop all those opinions on what you need. Right. The, that makes a lot of sense though when you have like SecOps that can focus on that. But if you're yeah. a one man team, it suddenly just adds to your plate. Can you share this uh, link to GitHub uh, for TFSec in Office Hours channel, in the Office Hours channel? Yep, yep. Sure can. Cool. And let's see. So we are, uh, we got 15 minutes left or so. 15. Uh, there were some other questions here unrelated to Terraform Cloud. I just want to see if we can get to that. Uh, Alex, uh, do you still want to uh, talk about this? Um, your uh, Prometheus question? Uh, let's see. Yeah, he can't. Um, he is chatting in the Zoom chat. Um, looks like Zach uh, helped you out uh, with the answer a little bit. Uh, I'll, I guess I'll just read it uh, for everyone else's. Uh, Benefit. Um, how do you? No. Uh, let's see. Assuming you have uh, Prometheus already running via like Prometheus operator, and you run kubectl get Prometheus all namespaces, you'd set up a service monitor. Oh wait, this is from Zach. I did not. Yeah, I gave him like the thousand foot view of an answer for how to set up a service monitor for a Prometheus for a custom service running in his cluster. I, I wouldn't have answered so quickly if I weren't working at it at the exact same moment he actually asked. So. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, uh, maybe we, uh, we we can. Uh, yeah, since you don't have a mic today, let's uh, let's punt on the question till next week if you're able to join us and we can talk more about uh, service monitor stuff. I'm curious if anyone else is using anything other than custom rules for, you know, in, in the. If there's any other tooling out there for service monitoring for adding, you know, if people, you have multiple teams, multiple microservices, and you know, if there's any organizational strategies around uh, tooling this in a declarative manner. And you, I, I, I can answer how we do it, but I'm interested also first before I talk about what other people are doing. And you're talking about just monitoring the individual services? Uh, yeah, just Prometheus, right? Teams exactly. and multiple services, and you know, there could be ephemeral. You know, there's some of them, you know, come and go. Um, ensuring that you know, generic monitoring gets put in place in teams if they want to put extra and additional monitoring, and you know, for for items, you know, that those are also able to be deployed. Um, yeah, I'm just gotcha. minorly struggling with uh, getting a good template going. That's all. Yeah. Are you using uh, Helm in your I work? Am. I am. Yeah, then, uh, sorry, I'm just, my computer's not being responsive here. So then, yeah, I can kind of show you, because this came up recently, uh, for example, with Sentry. Um, let's see a good example. I'm not sure if this is going to be the best one, but I'll show you. So uh, we've talked about in the past that we use uh, this chart called the mono chart. Uh, that we developed. Zach, are you familiar with the mono chart? Dude, I am so familiar with the mono chart. I okay. created my own version of it. So yeah, yeah oh, okay. it's inspirational. Awesome. Thank you. So. Yeah, so the, the pattern there that we have. And then are you familiar with the service uh, monitors that we, that, like the, the Prometheus bindings that we have in the mono chart? Uh, you know, I probably should go revisit it. So no, I'm not, honestly, I, you know, I haven't looked at it in a little okay. bit. Okay, so. so I will give a, Example of that here in a second. I'm just getting it 
queued up in my browser. So let me reframe the question, or let, not reframe, but let me restate the question and add some additional context. So uh, in my own words, I think what you're describing is, how do you offload the burden of uh, how an application is monitored to the application developers themselves, or the teams at least, uh, responsible for that service? Uh, in the old school model, it'd kind of be like, hey, you deploy your, your services and then you, you, you throw it over the fence to ops and say, hey, I, this is deployed, update Nagios or some ar uh, archaic system like that and, and monitor it. And that never worked well. Uh, and it, it's like very much like this data center mentality of static infrastructure and how it's configured. Uh, then you have a, a different model, which is kind of like in Datadog, where it will maybe auto-discover some of the things running there and figure out a strategy for monitoring it, which is magical, but it isn't very scalable, right? Magic doesn't scale. So you want something that uh, allows uh, configuration, but also uh, doesn't uh, bottleneck on some team to roll that stuff out. So this is why I think Prometheus operator is pretty rad is because you can uh, deploy your monitoring configuration alongside your apps themselves. So we have this, this just came up kind of like what you said, uh, uh, Zach, about that you were just actively working on this other problem that Alex had, so that's why I was fresh in your memory. So this is something that we did yesterday, actually. So we run Sentry on-prem. We've had some issues lately with Sentry uh, stop ingesting new events while everything seems totally normal. Uh, so it's passing health checks, everything's running, everything's green and hunky-dory. But uh, we, we wanted to we catch this situation where it stopped processing events. So at the bottom here, we've added, using the mono chart, for example, we, we don't have to create a separate release for this technically but we're doing that here. Uh, and using the mono chart, what we do is then we add the Prometheus rules uh, so we can monitor that the, the rate or you know, the, the delta here of job started um, uh, in five minutes over a five minute period is uh, not zero, or in this case is zero. So uh, that's when we alert on it as a warning. My, my point here though is, so let's see, are we using mono chart uh, to deploy this? Do you have something that keeps a baseline level of jobs starting? Uh, a busy cluster, <laughs> a busy environment. Okay. So it's like, you know, is this generalizable? No, but in this environment, uh, so here's the thing. Oh, I do uh, think it's generalizable because you could make that cron job, you know, that does job. Yeah, yeah. So, so in, in our case, we have Sentry Kubernetes deployed. So we have a we have a pod inside the cluster that is ingesting all the events from the Kubernetes API and sending those to Sentry. So you could say that we just by by uh, having that installed, we have our own event generator because Kubernetes is always doing something. Right. Um, so we, we ran, uh, when we ran this query, we saw it identified the two times over the past month that uh, had the outage. Uh, so we, we, we uh, deployed it and went live with that. But I just wanted, so this mono chart though is this pattern where um, you can define one chart that describes the interface of a microservice in your organization. This happens to be ours that we use in customer engagements, but you can, have, you can fork it or you can create your own that does the same kind of uh, thing. And let me go over to our charts here and see like a more, a different example that we have. So here's an example, uh, like a simple example of deploying an Nginx container using our mono chart. And the idea is that, it, it, you know, what, what does everything you deploy to Kubernetes needs? Well, it needs, uh, well, okay, if you're pulling private images, you're gonna need maybe, possibly you'll need pull secrets. So we define a way of doing pull secrets. Everything's gonna need an image. So we define a way of specifying the image. Most things are gonna need config maps. So we define a simple way of having consistent config maps. Um, and all of these things are a lot more terse than 
writing the raw Kubernetes resources. But you can also then start adding other things in here, like then we uh, provide a simple way of uh, defining uh, affinity rules. So you can specify an inline affinity rule, which is very verbose like this, or you can just use one of kind of like the macros, the placeholder ones that we define uh, here, should be on different node. And this is an example of how you can kind of create a library of common kinds of alerts that would deploy. Now, I'm talking, I'm conflating two things, affinity rules with alerts. I just happen to have uh, an example here of uh, the affinity rule. Uh, in Helm files here. Uh, you mean to share your screen? Oh my God! I actually knew you were that again. Anyways, but so. I'm just always used to having my screen shared. So I, yeah, so sorry. Okay, so this makes it a little less hand wavy then uh, by seeing my screen here. Here's what I had open, which was just uh, an example of using our uh, mono chart to define the Prometheus rules uh, to alert on Sentry. So here it's saying Sentry job started minus, uh, the, you know, Sentry job started five uh, minutes ago. Uh, and if that's zero, then we warn on it. So Monochart itself, uh, here, here we're using Monochart just to define some rules. But Monochart allows you to you know, define your, uh, your uh, deployment. Uh, so here's, an, you know, we're deploying um, Nginx. We're setting some config map values. We're setting some secrets, some environment variables. Um, yeah, here's the definition of the deployment. But, but we also, unfortunately, we don't have a JSON schema spec for this yet, so you, you kind of got to look at our examples of how we use Monochart, and that's a drawback. Uh, if I search for um, this here, then we'll find a better example. Oops. So, a good example here would be, hmm, not sure if KIM is going to be helpful either. Where we use monochart frequently is a lot of uh, upstream charts that we depend on don't always provide the resources we need. So then we can use monochart, much like we use the raw chart to define rules. So here, um, here's a, where we're deploying um, KIM uh, for uh, a, the KI, this is a, uh, com, uh, a controller that pulls metrics out of KIM and sends them to Prometheus. So somebody provided a container for us, but uh, the chart was subpar. So we just used our mono chart instead. So here we um, uh, define uh, a bunch of uh, service monitor rules to monitor uh, in this case, KIM. Uh, so this is complicated, like it's, it's using the raw expressions for Prometheus. But I want to say that like in your case, Zach, what, what I would do is I would define canned policies like this that you can enable um, in your chart for, for typical types of services. Okay, so that is the route I'm going. And so at least uh, the sanity check means I'm not going the wrong route. <laughs> so, yeah, I, you know, it's just, it seems like a lot of work. It is, but the thing is like, so, but, but no one else, Maybe I'm just lazy. but nothing else does this. No one else is doing this. So this is like, I, I, I don't see, I haven't seen any other option out there aside from magical auto discovery of things running for monitoring. This thing where applications deploy their own configuration for monitoring very, I don't know of any SaaS product that does that. Yeah, and it's very uh, specific to the team and organization and the labeling that you have in place. Yeah. Well. So, um, all right. Well, I mean, the, the mono chart is the, the right route in my mind as well. I've been going that route. I call it an arc, arc? type chart, arc type chart. So, but yeah, but um, I'm using that to do a bunch of other deployments and whatnot for yeah. these microservices. And this will, this will be rolled into it. So. All right. Thank you for, for the, uh, the answer. Yeah. And I, I want to just add one other thing that came up just for, to help contrast the significance of what we're showing here is 
yes, this stuff is a bit messy. I wish this could be cleaned up and it wasn't as dense. Uh, but when you compare this to like, let's say Datadog, and Datadog has an API, there's a Terraform provider for Datadog, but I would say that's the classical way of setting up monitoring. It's, it's, it's a tad better than using Nagios uh, because there's an API and you can use Terraform, but it's not much better than using Nagios because it's still this thing where you deploy your app and then this other thing has to run to configure monitoring for that. Versus what we're saying here is we deploy the app and the monitoring of the app as one package to Kubernetes using Helm. All right. Well, we're almost out of time today. Are there any last thoughts uh, or questions related to perhaps this Prometheus stuff? Uh, I didn't check if uh, you had posted anything else here, Alex, in the chat. Thank you for the uh, Terraform Cloud demo. Thanks. Yeah, that was awesome. Thanks for the demo. Thanks, man. No problem. That was, that was fun. Uh, let's see here. I think it's hard to solve this generic monitoring wise and generalizations, which can be hard. I suppose for most HP REST APIs, you could do some kind of anomaly detection or basic 500 alerts. But there's, yeah, there's not a general, there's no general metrics across all kinds of services. So yeah, uh, that's right, Alex. So uh, that's what all these other services do like Datadog or Sysdig is they'll provide you some, some good general kinds of alerts, but nothing purpose built uh, for your app. All right then. Let's see, I'm just going to tee up a uh, closing slide here. All right. Well, there you go. There's my secret sauce. That's what we're doing here. We're at the end of the hour. Here's some uh, links for you guys to check out. If you enjoyed office hours today. Uh, go ahead, join our Slack team if you haven't already joined. That's, uh, you can go to cloudposse.com slash Slack. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter by going to cloudposse.com slash newsletter. If you haven't yet registered for office hours, uh, definitely go there and sign up so you get the uh, calendar invite for future sessions. Um, and we host these every single Wednesday. Uh, we syndicate these to our podcast. So if you go to cloudposse.com slash podcast, you can uh, find out the links where you can subscribe to this, like in iTunes or whatever uh, podcast player you use. Connect with me on LinkedIn. And thanks again for, uh, yeah, for all your input and participation here. This is awesome. This is what makes SpeedOps possible. Thank you, John, for that presentation. And I'll see you guys all on the call next week. Take care. Thank you, guys. Later. Thanks. See you guys.